and Facebook, the Mustang that I drove in high school showed up. The owner, little story about how he bought it for me, a lot of it is fiction, a lot of it's fake news, so just take it with a grain of salt. I did not. The car was in pretty good shape. So I'm hoping that Asher or somebody else will buy me that car when it comes up for sale. Anyway, so I, I want to make sure, obviously, that Asher knows how to play football the best that he can if he's going to be buying me a Mustang, you know, when he gets that first paycheck. So I asked Andre Sims. I said, just talk to Asher for a moment. And I said, give him one piece of advice, if you would, that would help him to be the best football player that he could be. Andre thought about it for a little bit, and he said, Asher, it's really simple. Just do what your coach tells you to do. And that's really wise because coaches know the game. They've played the game. They know what it takes to win. Uh, Some of you are coaches. Ashley Terrell is a gymnastic coach. Jim Montgomery is a boxing coach. They've done gymnastics and boxing and other kinds of things in sports. And so any young athlete would be really wise to listen to an experienced, seasoned coach. Same is true in life. And especially in our focus this morning on Mother's Day. And even more specific than that would be young mothers. Listening to the older mothers or grandmothers who've played the game, so to speak. They know what it takes to win, so to speak and to coach them and encourage them to do the best that they can and listen to their life experiences, listen to them talk about their successes and their failures. And I want to emphasize this. Mothering is a whole lot more important than football. But football players, I think, get more coaching than mothers do. And parenting is hard. To be a spouse is difficult. And we need coaches. We need people to help us learn from their experiences what works and what doesn't. And here's some things we've picked up along the way and try this and try to avoid that, whatever else it might be. And so today we're going to survey several ways in the scriptures that we can be a blessing or how we can have a ministry to mothers, not only in our church, but in your families in your community, wherever the moms might be. We want to help them to do their best. Moms of all ages. And even if those, we have women or uh, in the church here who don't have children, we have men who don't have kids, we still have an influence on others and younger people in our church family and in our extended families. So we're going to look at a few ideas this morning. Let's begin with the first one. Number one of the, is this. Uh, how to have a ministry to mothers. Children can obey their, their mothers. <clears throat> Children can obey their mothers. Look at this verse here. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Now notice he says that it's a commandment with a promise. It's the first commandment with a promise. Actually, there are 10 commandments. We know about those. This is the fifth commandment. But with this commandment, there is a blessing attached to it. And here's how it reads. Exodus chapter 20 is where we find the 10 commandments in the Old Testament part of the Bible. Honor your father and your mother, we just read that, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. So this is instruction from God through Moses to the people of Israel before they go into the promised land. Here's how to prosper and to live a long life here in the land. So in what way would lives be prolonged if children honored their mothers. Let's just focus on that little slice, mm, cheesecake slice, that little slice at, at, at this point. Uh, there are many ways in which kids can prosper if they will simply honor their mothers or obey their mothers. Uh, it is the parents' parents' responsibility to teach their children life skills. And once you acquire or develop and master those life skills, you will live longer 
And one, very simple, if we're watching our youngest son and his wife with their youngest, with their only child, he's a little over a year old, teaching him how to eat, how to find food, how to gather food. Pretty soon, uh, Cooper is going to learn how to prepare food. He kind of helps dad in the kitchen already, uh, making pasta and those kinds of things. And it's a life skill. You're not going to live long if you don't eat food. You need food. It's one of those simple life skills. But more specifically, in the next chapter of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 21, it lays out the consequences for children who do not obey their parents, for children who do not honor their mother and their father. And it's harsh. It's the death penalty for rebellious and insubordinate children. There's a process that they follow just to check this child's heart, to check this child's attitude, to give that one many opportunities to get it together, turn it around, involving the community and all that. But in that community, in that culture, the consequence for disobedience and dishonoring parents was death. And that's harsh. But you know what? Very little rebellion in those homes. What was there instead? A high degree of respect for authority. And that's where authority, respect for authority is learned, is in the home. A child learns to respect and honor, obey his or her parents. And that spills out into learning how to uh, honor and respect other people in authority, like school teachers. I have uh, two children and one of their spouses Uh, who are teachers. And we talk occasionally about how difficult it is to be a teacher in a classroom today because the teachers have zero authority in the eyes of the children and do not have the authority to correct out-of-control behavior in schools. But the problem is not the school. The problem is the home. That's where respect for authority is learned. That spells out also over into respect for the police, honoring and obeying police officers, and governing authorities as well. Tell you what, if 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 you do not have respect for uh, authority in a school or in our community or for our government, your writ your your the chances of you living a longer life are significantly reduced because you're going to find yourself in all kinds of of trouble that could be life-threatening or even life-ending. It starts in in the home. So here's my point for this first point. Children who obey their parents are a blessing to their parents. They have a ministry to their parents. It's a ministry of encouragement. It's a ministry of blessing. We saw recently in 1 John, he says, I have no greater joy than this than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. God blesses children who are a blessing to their parents. It's good for kids to obey their mother and father. It's good for children to honor their mother and father. That's why it's in the scriptures all over the place. So the first ministry to mothers comes from those who made those mothers their moms. It's the kids. Kids can do that. And the ministry of children to their parents continues when those kids get older, when they become adults, but that ministry looks a little bit different. Let's look at number two here. Adult children can honor their mothers. First one is obey, second one is honor. And we're now going to be looking at adult children, uh, children who have grown up because they are no longer obligated to obey their parents, but they are obligated to honor them. Mark chapter 7, verse 10, Jesus is quoted here. He said, Moses said, honor your father and mother. We just looked at that in Exodus chapter 20. We just read that. But I'm going to back up just a little bit and show you the context of this short little phrase. Jesus has been challenged by the religious leaders of his day. And they're criticizing Jesus and his disciples, his followers, because they're not properly washing their hands before they eat a meal. And here is Jesus' response. 
Jesus was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. We just talked about that. Exodus 20, Exodus 21, it's in there. Jesus talked about it. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. So uh, what's going on here? Corbin, see this word Corbin, that's the name of my most recent alma mater, Corbin University, Christian University. Corbin means given to God, dedicated to God. And once something has been given to God or dedicated to God, it belongs to God. But in this case, in a physical, tangible sense, uh, the one who has given something to God Nobody else is allowed to use it except the one who gave it to God. For example, let's say I have um, I have a meal. I prepared a meal. I've got some food, and I dedicate it to God. Now, who's uh, I'm dropping here? If I see somebody who's hungry, and the, I know that I could and maybe should feed them. I'm not obligated to do so because that food has been dedicated to God and nobody else can use it except me because I dedicated it to God. He says I can use it as his steward or manager of what belongs to him. So here's what they were doing in Jesus' day regarding finances. It is is the children's obligation if they're able to help their parents when they're older in meeting financial obligations, they're to do that. That's biblical, it's responsible. And I hear my parents saying amen to that. Okay. Corbin, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm Corbining. <laughs> but, uh, so this, that's what a child would do. He would say, regarding my money, Corbin, I dedicate all my wealth to God. And so now nobody else is allowed to use it except me so I can't spend it on you because then you're benefiting by this and that's not allowed. Only only I can. Do you see that loophole that they have created there? And it's a man-made loophole and so they they discover a way to no longer have to fulfill their obligations. Thus, what are they doing? They're dishonoring their parents. And they're also invalidating the word of God because of their tradition, because of their loophole, because of their man-made method of skipping out of this responsibility. This man-made loophole here, it's a sin because it's invalidating what God says is one of the ways that adult children can honor their parents. And it's more than just finances. It's time. Spend time with your parents, visit with them, talk to them, socialize with them. If they need work around the yard or in the house or on their vehicle, if they need a ride to the store, if they need a ride to the airport or whatever it might be, if they have a need that you can meet, help them out. That's a ministry to my mother. It's a ministry to my parents. And it can be a ministry that you have to your mother or to your parents if they're still living. And if you don't have parents who are still living, or if you know of other elderly people, people older than you, who can benefit by your generosity and your giving, do it. It's a blessing. It's what God would have for us. So, number three. Here's a third way that we can have a ministry to mothers. Older women can encourage mothers. It says here, Titus chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Older women are to encourage the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that 
the word of God will not be dishonored. So here's again this idea of dishonoring or invalidating the word of God if we are not aware of what our responsibilities and opportunities are and then following through on them for the benefit of somebody else. It's not about us. It's about helping somebody else. So this word encourage is not the typical one we would think of where you come along somebody to comfort them or to guide them. This is a different word. And this means to make them right-minded. In other words, help the, the older women have an opportunity to help the younger women who are trying to figure out what, what does it mean to be a wife? Never been a wife before. What does it mean to be a mother? I've never been a mother before. Those who have decades of experience in both of these roles can come and help the younger women to think clearly and correctly about what it means to be a wife, what it means to be a mother. Um, I think you know this, that marriage is hard. Parenting is hard. It's not easy. There's a reason for it. And sometimes we feel like, you know, we're going to lose our minds trying to figure it out, or it's day in and day out and not sure what's going on. But the reason it's hard is because you married somebody like you. At the same time, somebody who is not like you. So that's difficult. That's a challenge. And the reason it's difficult raising children is because in a lot of ways, your kids are like you. And that's a challenge. And a lot of ways, the kids are not like you. And that's a challenge. So it's, it's not easy to be a spouse. It's not easy to be a parent. Uh, when Joanne and I were, were new parents down in California, Southern California, I was going to school and those kind of things, uh, we got a lot of good advice from friends who had raised their kids and helped us to sort out, you know, what do we do in this situation? How do we handle this? And what do we do about that? And, and even from some of our peers, they had just a little different perspective and um, we, we went to dinner one time with some friends that we met in our birthing class when our first kids were born. We both, named, both of us named our firstborn son Daniel. We met, met with Mike and Jane and their tribe and uh, went out to dinner. And those kids were very well behaved. And I asked Mike, I said, boy, Mike, I said, you guys nailed it. You got it down. Your kids are so well behaved and under control. And he said, you didn't see it, did you? I said, see what? And he said, this. I said, no. He said, if you did, you'd have seen every time I did this, my kids went pale. Because they know that this means you keep it up and we're going to have a little talk in the restroom and you're going to come out with swollen eyes. Not because you're being hit, because you're crying. I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to correct you. And it's not going to be a pleasant experience for you. And it shouldn't be. And so... uh, in the many years when I was teaching and preaching and the kids are in the congregation, I don't know how many, how many of you saw this, you know, when I was up there teaching and preaching. Here's the other end of it. This means I see that you're doing really well and I love you. Thank you. Little things like that. You know, you, you study your kids, you learn from one another, and you pick up these, these tips and these ideas. And Joanne and I, just a couple of weeks ago, were able to sit down with a young family with young children and kind of help them understand some of the things that we learned, our failures, our successes, and hopefully we've been able to pass that on to another generation. So we can help each other with this. We're in this together. So I want you to notice some of the ways that young women can feel like they're losing their minds from their husbands, relationship with their children, being workers at home. These are three different hats that the same person wears. Three different roles, three three different responsibilities, all while at the same time trying to remain sensible, pure, kind, and subject to their own husbands. There's a lot going on here. We talked uh, just recently about how every leadership team needs a team leader, and that's true in the marriage, in the home, in culture, society. Uh, It's true in the military. It's true in government. It's true in the church. And here, when it says to be subject to their own husbands, it's affirming and acknowledging that the husband is a spiritual leader in the home. 
doesn't mean that the wife is a second place or the mother is a second place citizen, not at all. But the buck stops at a desk and it's with the husband or with the dad in the home. And that's what, And this is something that needs to be taught. It's not natural. And the scripture says, help people to understand that this is God's order. There's always a team leader on a leadership team that's biblical, that brings balance and health and growth, all those kinds of good things. So if we fail in our duty of trying to help young women learn to be a godly wife and a a godly mother, we run the risk, here it is again, of uh, dishonoring the word of God. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. So how do we not dishonor the word of God? Do what it says. And then we will not be dishonoring the word of God. Instead, what we end up doing is we support each other, we encourage each other, and we're much farther down the road in helping one another not to lose our minds, you know, because we're going to help us to keep our minds where they need to be about these kinds of things. All right, fourth fourth and final thought, uh, the church can grow because of mothers. And by growth, I mean not only physically, but spiritually, both. Check this out, please. 2 Timothy 1.5. I am, this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. What's in you? The sincere faith. She's sincere about this. Notice that there's three generations here. There's Timothy and his mother and his grandmother. And so, so there they are listed for you. Lois and Eunice are the ones that planted in the heart of Timothy when he was younger the gospel seed. And that seed bore fruit. That seed came to life when Timothy was born again, when he gave his life to Jesus Christ and found salvation through faith in Christ alone. And at that moment, the church grew by one more person. The church was growing. God was adding to his number those who were being saved. Now, eventually, the Apostle Paul met Timothy and mentored him, discipled him, coached him. And Timothy became one of the more influential leaders in the early church, in the first century church. There are three what we call pastoral epistles in the New Testament. Two of them are written to Timothy. And those writings have become the staple for spiritual leaders around the world for millennia. And it started with Lois and Eunice being faithful in their home. Timothy's life and legacy is still bearing spiritual fruit. Still started at home with Lois and Eunice. They had no idea that this little boy they were talking to about Jesus would so profoundly impact the world for millennia. His life would impact billions of people over thousands of years. And so I think another one of the most significant ministries a child can have to his mother or her mother is to say yes to the gospel, is to say yes to Jesus, to be a part of the spiritual family of God. You see here it says that the apostle is mindful of Timothy's sincere faith. This word sincere literally means, and we're we're done with this, literally means without hypocrisy. That's the literal translation of it. Which means this, Who you are at church is who you are at home. Often it's uh, who you are at church is maybe different than who you are at home. Tell you, your kids see the difference. They see it. I don't think anything's going to drive a child away from the faith faster than hypocrisy, especially from his or her parents or parents. And so the way that that, one of the ways, there are many ways this sincere faith looks, 
and sounds? Is mom and dad, when you're wrong and you failed and you do, and I have and I still do, admit it? Your kids know it. And they're wondering if you're going to own up to it. And they're waiting. And they're watching. They don't see you own it up. You know what word comes across their mind? (laughs) Hypocrite. Say one thing and you do another. It's the fastest way to drive a child away from being where he or she, God, where God wants them to be. Perhaps the fastest way. Uh, I'll say this, then we're going to finish it. A church with healthy families is a healthy church. A church with healthy families is a healthy church. Listen, a community with healthy families is a healthy community. A nation with healthy families is a healthy nation. For crying out loud, it is not up to the government to fix our social problems. It's not the government's responsibility. It's not why the government exists. It's not the responsibility of schools to fix social problems. You know whose responsibility it is? Mom and dad. I think I mentioned recently, Chuck Swindoll wrote a book called Home, Where Life Makes Up Its Mind. It's a good title. It's true. So there's much more, of course. We'll talk a little bit about it during Flock Talk. But I wanted to put those four ideas out there in front of you show you that, you know, as I mentioned in in the Facebook post and the email that went out, moms do so much. They do so much for us. What can we do for our moms? We can can have a ministry to them in this way. So we're going to talk about it a little bit during Flock Talk. Let's take a moment. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing. And we'll take a break. And then we'll, we'll talk. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just a few of these ideas that are here in the scriptures about how to have a ministry to mothers. And as I said just a moment ago, moms do so much, more than we know. And we have an opportunity to be a blessing to them, regardless of how old we are, regardless of where we are. And I know that there are some whose mothers have recently passed. I know there are some who don't, maybe don't know who their mother is. Uh, Or maybe they were raised by a single mother or maybe raised without a mother. Maybe there are moms who are single mothers. That's probably the toughest job in the world. And so God, my prayer is that we as a church, not just with the small C, but with the big C, the universal church around the world, would have a sharper focus on the value of mothers in the home to build a foundation of trust and respect and honor and what is right and what is noble and what is good and what is pure and what is godly. And I think that's how Lois and Eunice raised Timothy. And and Timothy's ministry is still thriving 2,000 years later around the globe. It's amazing. Not one of us knows the influence or the impact that we are making on future generations. And it's not for us to try to sort out. Our calling, our task is to be faithful. So we will with your help with your grace and your mercy, with the ministry of your spirit dwelling within us and empowering us to be faithful. Not only for the moms among us, but for those of us that want to have a ministry to them and a blessing to them. I want to thank you for my mom, for her faithfulness to you, and thank you for Joanne's faithfulness to you and the impact that that is making and will make on many generations yet to come. We give you thanks, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to give the music team a moment to gather their music. (laughs) Gravity works. Gravity still works, man. We got gravity. We got aerodynamics. We got all sorts of things going on here.